Welcome to the HTML section of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript from the Ground Up course. In this section, we'll be talking about HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language. I'd wager that many of you have seen at least a bit of HTML at some point in your life. It's not too complicated, but it's the most important thing to get right because it serves as the foundation for your whole web page. Our goal in presenting HTML isn't to get into the technical details, since some of you may already be familiar with them. Instead, we're going to focus on best practices and the approach for how to write good HTML so you have a solid foundation. In simple terms, HTML defines content and structure. It's the skeleton of your web page, providing the framework that you'll stretch a skin of CSS onto and fill with JavaScript guts. A common misconception is that HTML is a programming language. It's not. Instead, it's a formatting or markup language. It adds structured information about meaning to your content. Many of you have already seen HTML, but let's have a quick review. The basic unit of HTML is an element. Each element is made up of an opening tag with attributes and can have content and a closing tag as well. Elements can be nested within the content area of other elements to form a tree or a hierarchy. Down at the bottom is an example of a paragraph element. It has an ID attribute and a class attribute. Both of these attributes are important because they let us differentiate elements from one another so we can selectively apply CSS and JavaScript later on. Keep those in mind, we'll come back to them. So that's what HTML looks like, but we want to talk about the best approach for how to use HTML. Basically, it all boils down to letting your data or content inform the markup that you choose. So the approach that you should take is to write your HTML first. Focus only on choosing markup that reflects the meaning of the underlying content. Once you move on to CSS, then you can start to think about how the content is presented. Notice the term semantic markup here. It means markup based on the content's meaning, not how it looks or other considerations. If you follow this approach, you'll come up with a solid HTML foundation. Let's look at some examples of some of the tools we have available to convey meaning. First, we've got headlines or headers. They come in six levels, from H1 all the way down to H6. Think of headers like you're writing a term paper in high school. You've got the title of the entire paper, which could be in H1, then sections, which could be H2s, then subsections as H3s, and so on. Headers help create a hierarchy from the sections of your web page. You wouldn't use an H3 element without first using an H2 and an H1 element, just as you wouldn't have a subsection of a paper without first having sections and a title. Don't think about how you want a header to be in a bigger or smaller font. That's presentation, and it can all be changed later with CSS. For now, only think about the structure of your content. There are also paragraph elements used to contain a paragraph of text. It's pretty simple. We also have lists. Unordered lists are made up of a UL element containing many LI, or list item, elements. An unordered list should be used when the order of the items in the list is not significant. A good example might be a shopping list. All the items on the list are of equal importance. An ordered list, on the other hand, should be used when the order of the items is significant. The only difference is that it's an OL for ordered list instead of UL for unordered list. An example of this might be search results. It's significant that the first result is first because it's more relevant than the second result, and so on. There are also links or anchor elements. This is what makes the web go. When the user clicks on content inside of an anchor tag with an href attribute, the browser's default behavior is to navigate to the URL in the value of the href attribute. There are also emphasis elements, or M, which say the content should have more emphasis than the surrounding content. By default, the content inside an M element is displayed as italic in normal browsers. But if we were using a screen reader, which is a web browser that speaks the content of the pages out loud, the voice would rise in pitch, conveying the semantic meaning by adding more audible emphasis to the content instead. This brings us to a question. What's the difference between the italic, or I, element, and the emphasis, or M, element? Or how about the bold, or B, element, and the strong element? Both emphasis and italic render as italic text in browsers, and both strong and bold render as bold text. Well, italic and bold both refer to the presentation of content. Emphasis and strong, on the other hand, refer to the meaning of the content. They tell you why the content should be rendered as italic or bold. Emphasis and strong are the newer elements that were added to HTML once we started to figure out that separating content from presentation was a good idea. Another group of elements that are often misused is the table. 
Here's an example of a good use of a table. A table element contains multiple table row, or TR, elements. Each of those can contain table header, TH, or table data, TD, cells. This table has two columns with headers and two rows. Lindsay is 33 and Jin Yu is 22. This is a good use of a table because it reflects the meaning of the content, which is tabular data. One giveaway that it's a good use of a table is that it actually has column headers and multiple rows. Now here's an example of a bad use of a table. There's nothing tabular about this data. The giveaway is that there aren't any table headers and there's only one row. Instead of using a table to mark up tabular data, this developer looks like he's trying to take advantage of the fact that table cells render as boxes from left to right in normal browsers. They're using a table to accomplish a three column layout. But layout is a property of how content is presented. It's not a part of the meaning of the content itself. So it just doesn't have any place in HTML. This is a job for CSS, as we'll see later. There are actually a bunch of HTML elements. Here are the HTML elements in the HTML4 spec. We have a similar list in the course materials inside the utilities directory for you to reference if you need to. You can also search for HTML element references online. Do you see any of these elements that look bad? In other words, that look like they're more about presentation than the meaning of the content? Well, there's the blink tag. That's definitely about presentation, and it's not even in good taste. How about the font tag? Font's entirely presentational and doesn't have anything to do with the meaning of the content. We might use different fonts to signify different meaning, but we should talk about the meaning in HTML using perhaps a span element with a class name, and then assign a font to that meaning using CSS. The small tag is another example. This content should be presented as smaller than the content around it. But why? This element says nothing about the meaning of the content, or why it's small. Or what about the line break, or BR element? It says that there should be a line break in the text content at this point. This is a great example of when it's up to you as the developer to use HTML well. The line break tag can be used to convey meaning. For example, if you were marking up poetry, the line breaks between lines in a stanza are actually a part of the poem's content, and not its presentation. On the other hand, if you're using three line break elements in a row to create additional space between two bits of content, you're using the line break element for presentation. Instead, you should just enclose each of the bits of content within their own element, like a div or a paragraph, and then use CSS to control the space between them. Another thing to keep in mind is that there are different types of HTML. Earlier I mentioned the HTML4 specification, but there are others as well. You tell browsers which kind of HTML you're writing with a doctype declaration at the top of your HTML file. You can also use a tool called a validator, like the one provided by the W3C, to make sure that the HTML you write follows the rules of the HTML specification that you've chosen. Doctypes have a lot of complicated bits and pieces that have to do with validation. These aren't really that important, but you can come back and look at it later if you want. All you really need to know is this version, the minimal HTML5 doctype. It's important because the presence of a doctype at the top of your HTML file tells all browsers to render your web page in something called standards mode. Standards mode is the most recent rendering mode that tries to follow the CSS specification as closely as possible. If you don't have a doctype, your web page will render in something called quirks mode in some browsers. Quirks mode doesn't follow the CSS specification and may cause you to pull all your hair out in frustration. If you're having problems with a page not rendering the way you think it should, the first thing you should always do is check to make sure you have a doctype. The easiest way to learn more about this semantic approach to writing HTML is just to see it in action. So let's move on to the HTML exercise screencast. You can watch as we start from scratch adding markup to content, paying attention to the meaning instead of the presentation. You'll also get a chance to try this approach out for yourself.